Welcome to Renegade Inc. Over millennia, and certainly since Field of Dreams, the idea that build it and they will come has prevailed. After Kevin Costner's massive success, it seems that politicians have taken his gung-ho approach to construction too literally. Olympic stadiums often bankrupt host nations, and the Skyscraper Index tells us that the world's tallest buildings are completed on the eve of a significant economic downturn. So why haven't we ever made the link between senseless construction and politics? We went to Coconomics, the leading economics festival in Norway, to talk with the anthropologist David Graeber about back construction, a trend that has gripped the world. David, uh, welcome. We're in Norway, uh, Stavanger. Yeah, here we are. Yeah, here we are, uh, <laughs> in a basement. And um, a city with plenty of oil money, but everyone drives around in Teslas. <laughs> I, see, I see no contradiction here. Um, congratulations on board jobs. Were you surprised by the reaction to that book? Not to the book. No, the book did well. Um, I was surprised by the original reaction to the article, which is why I had to write the book, essentially. Oh. Uh, I wrote the book kind of as a joke, really, more than anything else. A friend of mine was starting a magazine, wanted me to write something provocative, so I kind of threw something out. And it's more like the kind of slightly drunken rant you might say at a party than article. But he said, oh, no, no, Des will publish anything you say. So I said, all right, what the hell? <laughs> and before I knew it, the thing had gone viral. Now, hot on the heels of bullshit jobs is back construction. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so talk us through the logic. Was this another drunken rant? No, actually, this was something that I got onto when I was trying to understand the appeal of right-wing populism, actually, and the sort of economic background to it. And also because of climate change. I, I've actually recently been involved in a project, Extinction Rebellion, asked a group of heterodox economists or put together a brain trust to come up with how to actually get to zero carbon by 2025, largely just to say that it's possible, but also to sort of open up directions that might be pursued. They want to convene a series of citizens' assemblies. Uh, and the idea would be to, how would we provide technical information so that they could make the key decisions in that regard. And one thing we discovered was that, you know, huge amount of waste, carbon, of ecological destruction are really coming out of the construction industry. Right. Much more so than, I mean, for even when it comes to domestic waste, you know, there's all this morality around recycling. But if you look at where the waste in, say, landfills comes from, if everybody in the world recycled everything and, and didn't throw away anything at all, it would make only half as much difference than if they cleaned up construction waste. That if they just stopped knocking down old buildings and building new ones and just rehab the old ones instead. Right. And when you have linked the uh, right wing populism to this, it seems to me like a massive jump. So can you make that leap for us and just how that association works? It all came from why is it we have Donald Trump, who's a real estate and construction guy, mm. as the sort of, well, I was going to say crypto fascist, but he's not really that crypto, is he? <laughs> <laughs> sort of quasi fascist president of the United States. And my first realization was that the Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump election essentially represented the divorce of finance and real estate. Why is that? I'd explain that to us. Yeah. Me. One thing that had always impressed me was that I read an article many years ago about financing for American politicians and where the money comes from for different parts of the political spectrum. And the only money that would go to the sort of left wing of the Democratic Party, they said, well, there was a Hollywood money and a few other interests like that, but mainly it was coming from real estate. Well, to, to the left? Yeah, the real estate would fund social democratic candidates because real estate wanted people to be able to afford houses. You know, they have a product they can't export. If you're a real estate guy in New York City and San Francisco, well, you know, there's an international market, but if you're in Des Moines, so you want people in Des Moines to have money. So that made sense. But essentially, they seem to have made some kind of devil's deal with finance. And that's how we got to 2008. Right. So what the hell? We don't have to redistribute the money. We can just lend them the money and then play around with all these elaborate securitized derivatives and wait for the whole thing to explode. So for a while, credit substituted. And 
you get this alliance between finance and real estate, which is not really precedented in previous periods of time, but it explodes in 2008. Obviously, something has to be done. And you have the Obama interlude, but the moment there's a really strongly contested election, you get on the one hand, Hillary Clinton, who's essentially running as the candidate of Goldman Sachs, you know, financial interests and ideology of sort of neoliberal finance. And is also, the, interestingly enough, the candidate of war. She's like trying to start a war with Russia. She's incredibly belligerent in her foreign policy. Now, Trump, he's a real estate construction guy, and he kind of adopts a, a classic mid-20th century corporatist politics, a corporatist in the sense of saying that, well, employees and employers in industry have common interests against finance. And that was the basis both of social democracy and fascism in a certain sense, so if you say in the 30s or 50s. But at the same time, he sort of posed himself against global elites. There's always a kind of nativism, even in the social democratic version of, of, of corporatism. But owing to the weird nature of the American imperial arrangements, the fascist guy is running as the peace candidate. Right. And he's you know, explicitly about dismantling the American empire, which he had been talking about for 20 years. And I'm convinced is actually trying to do in his own ham-fisted way. Whereas Hillary <laughs> was running and her bellicose policies were mm -hmm. going to run straight through that campaign and you, know, yeah, you could potentially explicit. now be at war with Russia. If... I know. I mean, it's possible we'd all be dead. Right. actually, if she had won. I don't know. So the divorces, though, the finance, so the Goldman candidate, Hillary Clinton, and mm -hmm. the builder, the right. construction <laughs> guy, the blue collar guy, right. uh, Donald Trump. So you've got this faction now. Mm -hmm. Now what? Why, why has that happened? And why is that relevant to back construction? Well, this is what I became very interested. I started looking into this. And I realized that the pattern kind of repeats itself. What Hillary Clinton, the Clintons in general, represent, same thing as Obama, really, same thing as Macron, to some degree Merkel in Germany, this sort of centrism. Centrism, which is closely tied to finance and uh, financial interests. And politically, the real mainstay support of that is in the professional managerial classes. I think Tom Frank wrote about this in great detail. It's a very important point that essentially what used to be left-wing parties, at least partly working class constituency, uniformly dumped their working class constituents over the course of the 70s and 80s and adopted the professional managerials as essentially their core constituency that they answered to. And those people essentially became the allies of the financial elites, the 1% that we used to talk about and occupy. So you have that as one political center. And the other one is the emerging right-wing populace who represent themselves as working class. And there's a lot of arguments about how much the working class really does vote for those guys. To some degree, the working class didn't vote for Trump. They just wouldn't bring themselves to vote for Hillary either. They sat it out in America. But the working class is divided. It's a classic petty bourgeois kind of constituency that the kind of people who voted for fascists, who vote for fascists now. But, you know, the question is, what is the sectors of capital that push that? And I wanted to do kind of an 18th Brumaire, you know, uh, sort of analysis. What are the dynamic sectors of capital? What sort of political forces do they support? And I realized, well, there's the extractive industries, but there's also construction. Construction is huge globally, and, and it's a driving force of capitalism. In the UK, where I am, those are the two dynamic sectors of the economy, is you know, there's a property bubble and then there's construction boom. And insofar as you have a working class which is visible and active, it's in the construction industry, it's in creation and maintenance of infrastructure, which means that labor organizing takes a whole different form. And that's how you have people like David Harvey, you know, sort of Marxist theorists saying, well, you need to stop thinking about factories as the locus of where the proletariat is. Proletariat is actually building cities. They're the guys who maintain cities. So you need to talk about the right to the city and right. urban space. So the old yeah. So the old factory workers have become the construction workers. Yeah. And what does that mean from an anthropologist's point mm. of view? What does that mean? Well, first you have to look at how labor in the construction industry around the world is organized. And again, this is, you know, I haven't done this research. I am largely sort of drawing bits and pieces together from people I know located in different parts of the world. The organization of labor in the construction industry in a remarkable number of places tends to be organized around, you know, a sharp dichotomy between a kind of working class elite um, the sort of Archie Bunker hard hat types. And, you know, even in the 60s, construction workers, people in that sector were the ones who were considered to be the most reactionary and nativist, right? They're also very highly paid and unionized. And they were, sort of, they were the ones the ones who really protected and did identify with the interests of their employers to a large extent. Uh, and then, you know, an extremely marginalized, unskilled, usually immigrant workforce. And this is true in a remarkable number of places. When I was in Japan, 
homeless construction workers are a major phenomena. Right. A lot of the focus of, of dramatic labor organizing is around these guys. And, and it's all done through the mafia. The mafia, you know, the Yakuza would come with these trucks and pick up these guys who had camps and places and take them to day jobs. And that structure repeats over and over again. The sort of First of all, because the construction industry tends to be the most corrupt for obvious reasons. Uh, real mafias do get involved in racketeers of various kinds. It's very, very true in America because, you know, you need to work with government, you know, not only for permits and so contracts and things like that, but on every level, it, to a degree which making, have, simply having a factory doesn't do. And so it's all caught up in these sort of mafia sort of arrangements. You have this dichotomy between a working class elite and a usually racialized, often immigrant under class. And that pattern sort of repeats itself as a kind of psychological basis for a lot of right-wing populism as well. I think. So the link that you're making is that um, if you're in a factory, you can be unionized, but still get on with your life. You don't need government involvement. If yeah. you're in construction, you need state sponsorship to be able to get on and unleash. It's almost by definition crony capitalism. I mean, speaking of crony capitalism as if it's some kind of anomaly is absurd. It has to be pretty much. And then at the election of Donald Trump, what you're saying is uh, that it's an absolutely logical next step for America. Yeah. That the construction guy who yeah. uh, has arguably paid people off and all the rest of it to get what he needed done yeah. um, has become the president. Yeah, he practically said so. I mean, his whole drain the swamp rhetoric was essentially to say, well, look, I know the system is corrupt. I know these guys take bribes. I'm the guy who bribes them, you know? Like, who would you rather have? The guy who has to pay the money or the guy who takes the money? So back to the right-wing populism and, and back to construction. Just crystallize yes. that alliance. All right. Well, the thing that I started to notice as soon as I looked into it is just how much this model is spreading around the global south as the most effective model of development. And this partly comes from China. China essentially found this formula where you have very, very easy credit, which is, you know, outside observers talk about this, you know, terrible, corrupt system where they have all these shady deals, again, this kind of crony capitalism, but just pouring money and cheap credit that into non-viable projects, often non-viable projects. You know, so the financial sector in China is supposed to be a disaster, but that's how they managed to pull off, you know, 10, 12, 15% growth rates uh, with these massive construction projects, which in China worked as a way to kickstart the economy really well, India started doing the same thing. And again, everybody talks about the corruption and easy credit and shady deals in the Indian financial sector as a problem. Clearly, it's the secret to their massive growth. So on some level, that thing, that combination actually works. However, obviously, at some point, you have to put the brakes on or it goes crazy. And that clearly, that's what's happening all over the world. Everybody's trying to do it. So if you look at Modi, if you look at uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Ahmadinejad uh, did this in, in Iran, they just started pumping out cheap credit to build these complete bad crazy construction projects. And almost always, it's the right-wing populists who are doing this. And often what it leads to, especially when, since it is so political, is creation of completely insane infrastructure that nobody actually wants. You know, there's a huge housing crisis in this country, and not just in this country. I think it's affecting cities and countrysides in large parts of the world. In cities like this one, one of the factors is, um, you know, the, the building of housing units for absentee speculators, absentee owners. That has uh, generated, um, and you can see it is visible on the housing landscape, a lot of empty tower blocks, neighborhoods that are pretty vacant because people are seldom there. They're in other parts of the world where living in one of their other properties. I think you can also see the equivalent in um, the building of commercial space. There's a long history of that happening in Manhattan. The building of office space in particular, commercial office space that no one really needs. I mean, down on, um, in the World Trade Center, when the World Trade Center was initially built, it's very difficult to find tenants for the millions of square feet of office space down there. And it took many decades to fill up these towers. Likewise, and it's sort of connected to World Trade Center, what we've seen in the last 10 years or so is the development of a huge part of the west side of Manhattan called Hudson Yards, which is full of luxury uh, housing units and also office space that absolutely no one ever needed. <laughs> 
it made financial sense to build them because it generated the need for credit and it raised the land prices on the west side of Manhattan, which benefits the development and real estate community in general. So there are economic reasons for doing it, but they're not being driven by the need or the demand um, for units like these. And uh, it's, it's not healthy in a city to have uh, places like this, neighborhoods that are just deserted. One of the things that shocked me when I learned it, in, in London, for example, you know, one reason why the economy is being held up by a construction boom, and construction in the UK is more than anywhere else in Europe, but past Germany is just rocketing ahead, but it's actually cheaper to build a new building than to rehab an old one. You get a tax break if you rip down a building and build something else. If you just rehab the old one, you don't. And we're possible? straight back to the political class. Yeah, exactly. The very clear link you've made in that first half is uh, that uh, batch construction can only really happen and exist mm -hmm. with political sponsorship. Absolutely. Yeah. State sponsorship. Um, and really that implicates Trump uh, in the US, and, but many, many leaders all over the world. Why are they doing this? Is it to get GDP figures up? Is it to look like the strong man who you know, can get things moving? Let's get the economy moving. What's the, what's the rationale? Well, I mean, I think that has always been the case, that empires and fascists love building and construction. It's a way to take financial abstraction and make it seem real. You know, right. because we live in a world full of numbers where numbers define our reality. And I've always thought the phenomenon of ATM machines was interesting that way, because, you know, when they did, as we learned in 2000 with the Bush election, you know, voting machines have a regularly go wrong at 0.2 percent um, rate or something like that. Almost everything has, has a rate where they go wrong. The only thing that never goes wrong are ATM machines. We just assume that it'll give us the right <laughs> amount of money. We don't even count, right? So they've created a world where a financial abstraction is the only thing you can actually count on. And in a way, like a lot of what, you know, the escalator doesn't work, the elevator doesn't work, like um, the trains don't run on time, but the ATM machine is always oh, accurate. Well. So it's a well, way of saying what's really real are numbers and finance. Yeah. We don't know because we don't <laughs> count that money. We're way too okay. trusting. Right? Yeah, exactly. But, but so you get all these digits, uh, you know, on the spreadsheets and, and a way to make those material is to put up a massive building and often quite phallic, you know, because in the Gulf yeah. states, you know, you have people out competing each other. Well, no, our tower is two inches taller than yours. <laughs> and, you know, and, then yeah. another, and you're like, where does this logically stop? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much so. And I remember reading somewhere when I uh, was first learning economics that there's a general formula that anytime somebody builds the tallest building in the world, there will be a financial crash within three years. Right. Yeah, so what goes up must come down. Right, so they're, they're testaments to <laughs> yeah. human stupidity yeah. and terrible economics. Yeah. The wider effect's a lot more serious, isn't it? Mm. Because uh, it affects our health, it affects land monopoly, it affects housing prices, it affects uh, how we interact with cities. It does, Th yeah. This isn't just an academic argument sitting above everything else. It actually ha impinges on all of our lives at different points. What are the human effects of this battery construction? Well, I mean, I, I live actually um, in Ladbroke Grove in London, not far from Grenfell Towers, so you can see the human effects immediately. Uh, on the one hand, you know, these things that are put up to house the poor and then given no attention are actually the Grenfell people basically died because they'd insisted on putting pleasant decoration on the outside so it wouldn't ruin the views of the rich people who are moving in nearby, but they didn't bother to get the, the fireproof kind because it would cost too much. So, I mean, these directly affect people's lives in the most immediate ways. And then, of course, most of the people who were displaced by the fire who did survive actually you know, I think some of them still aren't housed. It took years to find them any set of proper accommodation, mm. despite the fact that I think about one out of every 20 houses in that neighborhood is unoccupied. But would you put the Grenfell uh, example and would you put London as a city as the epitome yeah. of back construction? It is. It's going, there's stuff going up everywhere, but people can't afford to have a place to stay. So what are they building and why are they building it? The finance seems to be have nothing to do with actually answering human needs. It's all speculative and luxury stuff. You know, buy another apartment for someone who already has one. I was wondering, in fact, what is going on with London and real estate in general? When I first came to England, I was trying to figure out the British economy. 
you know, the sort of standard line is that the UK supplies financial services to the rest of the world. And it, you really think about that, what it basically they seem to be saying is that people in England are really good at paperwork. We're so good at paperwork that people in Brazil and China get, send us their cars and sneakers in exchange for our paperwork. And it's like, there's plenty of people who can do paperwork in China and Brazil. That can't be it. So, but it's yeah. the export of neoliberal finance. Right. But what does that actually mean? And, and the more I asked people who I thought would know, they said, well, it's all based on a housing bubble. So what it's really based on is speculation on London real estate. And London real estate is vastly inflated because basically any rich person in the world has to have a place in London. Why London? I asked people that who I thought would know, and they said, well, it's, it's considered safe. There's two things. First, you can get anything you want in London, not only theater, you can also get the best servants and nannies and anything you could possibly imagine you want. You can find someone provided by, you know, cheerful people who really are good at being servants. You know? And second of all, you're safe. Right. Has you know, anyone told these people that uh, knife crime in London <laughs> has gone absolutely through the roof? Yeah, the how street... many rich people have been killed from knife crime? Like Very few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's not safe to walk around with a big watch on now. I mean, mm. with moped gangs. And also, uh, the streets in mm. great swathes of the city have been lost. It's interesting, yeah. But And not again, this is a, if you are going to exclude people mm -hmm. back construction... Nah, but, yes. Then, then you're naturally going to get this. So you're going to get mm -hmm. the so-called progress of the construction, and you're going to get the poverty. Now, exactly. you don't have to be a genius to work out that you know these two are interlinked. Mm -hmm. Is that the nub of this? I think so. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain sort of amount of triage, and you push, you know, decanting people farther and farther away seems to be the big source. What's going on in London for the last twenty years? They've just been exiling the working class from anywhere near where the rich people are. So with the result that cleaners and people like that often have to commute two hours either way, you know, right. just to get to the place they clean. And if developers have in London had to, because of the provision within the planning permission, put uh, social housing in, mm -hmm. uh, now we have a thing called poor doors. So everyone else can go through the normal door and yeah. the audience here mm -hmm. probably won't realise yeah. this, but Very they also have a poor yeah. door mm -hmm. where the social housing uh, so folks have to go through. Incredible times. Yeah, but it's perceived as safety. And that's what I realised, that. That, you know, if you come from Kuwait, something could go wrong. If you come from, you're a Singapore diamond magnate, you know, something might still happen. China could come in some of there could be a popular unrest. If you're in Brazil, a Brazilian steel magnate, a leftist government might expropriate. Everybody can imagine something and threatening their wealth. But London is considered absolutely safe, you know. <laughs> been taken off the table in 1694, you know, nothing no more is going to happen. Brexit. <laughs> yeah, that's not going to affect them. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I actually think, you know, what this means is the historical sort of defeat and humiliation of the British working classes has now become England's export product. Explain that. Yeah. I mean, here we have a working class that's not going to rise up that will provide you any service you want. <laughs> you know, you can get Mary Poppins, you can get, you know, like <laughs> the nannies, the maids, the butlers. You know, they really know how to do that. They, they'll do it with a smile. And that's what they're selling. I mean, so, so the whole royal edifice is part of the advertisement for a subservient social order, which all these magnates want to buy into. How long does that last? Well, I don't know. But it creates a tension because people People know that, you know, if you're a working class person in England, you know that the money that's kind of coming in is based on this perception of your subservience. And, you know, they want to hit, but they can't really hit out at the rich foreigners, you know, who are coming in. So they hit out at the poor ones. And we're back to right wing. Then populism. that's that's where you're back to right wing populism. As we conclude, you talked about Trump, obviously the US president, uh, but I'm going to give you a wicked problem to solve. Okay. And it goes for the Tory party, the Conservative party in the UK as well. Their biggest donors are house builders. Here How, we go. And, and, and we're back to the state sponsorship of okay. this. How on earth do you begin to unlock that wicked problem? Because it turns out turkeys don't vote for Christmas. Well, I mean, we need to change the democratic model to get rid of the funding system that we have now, which is basically a system of institutionalized bribery. I mean, this goes back to Occupy Wall Street. I mean, people don't understand when we talked about the 1% to the 99%. That was there when those initial discussions. What we were talking about was not just wealth or inequality. I don't even like the word inequality. It just makes it sound like it's a technocratic question of adjustment of, you know, just how much inequality do you want? We were really talking about it was class power. The 1% are both the people who have got all of the profits for economic growth for basically since 2008. And they're also the people who make all the campaign contributions. So essentially, they're people who can turn their power into wealth and their wealth back into power. It's a cycle. 
Now, you need to break out of that cycle somehow, and that requires political change. And you know, what, what we see all over the world is movements which no longer want to work within the conventional political party system because they see it as inherently corrupt, is based on the cycling. And the construction money is perhaps the clearest example of that. But it's happened on endless different levels that you know, people have set up a way of turning the political system into a cash machine. I mean, it's so obvious that with banks too. Bank regulation is mostly written by the banks. And they just like, you know, show up with their lobbyists and say, well, we propose this legislation. They negotiate with the aides to the whatever congressman they're bribing, you know. Obviously, you know, the corruption index in America, I always say, is the, one of the lowest in the world. But that's because it's almost impossible to bribe a politician because giving money to a politician to influence their vote is legal. <laughs> right. <laughs> what would you have to do to bribe them? As we conclude, what is the one thing that um, the voter, you and I, can do right. to begin to talk about batch construction, bullshit jobs, and understand the environmental cost, mm -hmm. the human cost, and ultimately the political cost? Because what you've um, highlighted throughout this mm -hmm. is if we continue down this track, not mm -hmm. just environmental destruction, but we're absolutely ripping souls out of cities. Yeah, I mean, the bullshit jobs already is soul destroying, but the destruction of communities. And since the 80s and 90s has been an almost intentional political project of pretty much across the political class, but especially of the right of Thatcherism above all. But everybody followed suit. You know, there was a dismantling, even those left-wing political parties that had sort of community groups, and they, they started taking them all apart and um, stopped doing that in the 80s so that social housing, the first thing they always got rid of when they cut budgets was all the places where everybody could meet and discuss things. Mm -hmm. So there's been a movement away from community. And then, you know, exiling people into these jobs where they're largely doing nothing all day. It's just to keep them off the streets. Mm. So, so that I've always said social media has become this sort of, it's the form of counterculture appropriate to a younger generation that has to spend most of their time pretending to work. <laughs> That's what you do when you're at the computer screen and nobody knows that you're not, don't have anything to do. You go <laughs> on social media. Yeah. How do we conclude? <laughs> what do we do? What's the one thing that we can take away from this that we start thinking about to uh, enact this kind of change? I think some kind of UBI, uh, read it, massive elimination of people's se sense of desperation that, you know, if they don't get whatever is on offer, they will not be able to provide for their family. And how do we stop batch construction? Well, I mean, since so much of it is specifically sponsored and, and enabled by the government, just stop doing that. That would be really easy. David Graeber, thank you very much for your time.